This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support my channel, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. Nobody likes paying taxes. I think that's something we can all agree upon, regardless of political beliefs. But as unpleasant as it may be, taxes are the price we pay for living in a functioning society, at least at this point in history. Our taxes pay for roads, schools, fire departments, and public transportation. Of course, American taxes are exceptionally low compared to other countries, and our public resources suffer because of it. Our infrastructure is outdated and fragile, our public transportation nearly non-existent, not to mention the fact that we are the only industrialized nation without some form of universal healthcare. Believe it or not, people who pay more in taxes in our peer nations end up saving money, because things like healthcare, which is incredibly expensive in the US, are free in their countries. But this episode isn't about taxation in general. It's about one specific report that reveals just how little the country's richest people pay in taxes. Spoiler alert, it's way less than you pay. Recently, the independent nonprofit news outlet ProPublica released a stunning report titled The Secret IRS Files, in which they reveal the means by which the ultra-wealthy pay next to nothing in taxes, as well as their effective tax rates based on how much they pay compared to the growth of their wealth. For example, Jeff Bezos, the richest person on Earth, paid a true tax rate of 0.98% between 2014 and 2018, despite his wealth growing by nearly $100 billion in that period. The average American pays a rate of 14.6%. So the richest man on the planet, who is currently worth over $190 billion, enjoys a tax rate that is 15 times lower than the average American, who earns in their entire lifetime less than what Bezos accumulates in just 15 minutes. Now, there are plenty of weird finance bros who will jump to defend the billionaires by saying things like, look, they're not doing anything illegal, unrealized gains on things like stocks aren't taxed until you sell. Despite missing the point a little bit, these people are mostly correct. Billionaires like Bezos, Musk, and Buffett, while generally getting up to some shady tax practices, are at least mostly operating within the confines of the law. They simply take advantage of the way the system is set up to exploit their vast riches, live an obscenely lavish lifestyle, and pay essentially nothing in taxes. I'll let ProPublica take the stage for a minute. Here's their short video explaining exactly how these oligarchs exploit the system. Some of the very richest Americans pay little in taxes compared with how fast their fortunes grow each year. How? They use a tax strategy known as buy, borrow, die. It's like the ultra wealthy are living on another planet. Average people need income to pay for basics like housing and food. But the ultra wealthy don't. They can just live on borrowed cash. Step one, buy. The ultra wealthy buy an asset or build a company or inherit a fortune. As long as they don't sell, they owe no taxes. They keep their income as low as possible since every dollar they earn can be taxed. Step two, borrow. They borrow against their holdings and the bank gives them a really good deal. I'll loan you $10 million with only 3% interest. But if you take a $10 million salary from your company, you'll owe almost 37% to the IRS. So the ultra wealthy use loan money to fund their lifestyles. That's how a billionaire can live the most luxurious life imaginable while reporting little to no taxable income. Step three, die. When they die, these lucky few often use complicated trusts and philanthropic foundations to avoid the estate tax and their heirs can inherit stocks and other assets tax-free. A new generation is ultra wealthy and the cycle starts all over again. When it's laid out simply like that, without all the intentionally dense tax language and obfuscation, it becomes clear how absurd the whole thing is. The fact that Warren Buffett can pay a tax rate of one-tenth of one percent is insane. This is a trend that has been worsening for years. Since the 1950s, and accelerating since the 1980s, tax rates among the wealthy and corporations have fallen precipitously, largely because of the misguided American belief in trickle-down economics, and the increasing power of the wealthy as government officials have become more and more dependent on corporate donations. What we're seeing now, and what the ProPublica report has revealed, is the result of these regressive tax policies. 
Thanks to his obscene wealth on paper and the ability to avoid taxation by simply accumulating and not selling, Jeff Bezos has access to functionally limitless amounts of money through generous loans. It's how he was able to buy a custom $500 million superyacht, which is so big it comes with a smaller support yacht, complete with its own helipad. When the weird online billionaire defenders say things like, they're not actually that rich, it's mostly on paper, ask them how he can afford a half a billion dollar yacht, or five full floors of luxury New York City apartments, which he plans to combine into a single 17,000 square foot mega condo, or the rest of his $500 million real estate portfolio. If someone can buy all these things, yes, they're that rich. They're just not using their own money to do it. They're using the loans they can get because of their tremendous portfolio of assets. Many of the ultra-wealthy have adopted a new habit of claiming they support higher taxes on the rich. This is a great bit of PR, because it costs them nothing to say it. And all the while, they're lobbying behind the scenes to make sure their taxes stay as low as possible. That's the main problem with the system as it exists today. It's not that the US desperately needs tax revenue from the rich, though it would help. It's the fact that these oligarchs can effectively steer the government themselves, without ever having to be elected or be seen supporting one team or the other. And that's the secret. There's really only one team. They may wear different colors, but Democrats and Republicans share the goal of maintaining the status quo, which leads to further enrichment of the already rich and powerful, the continued worsening of inequality, and the lining of their own pockets thanks to eye-watering corporate donations. There's a quote by Julius Nyerere, the first president of Tanzania, that sums up American politics pretty well. He said, The United States is also a one-party state, but with typical American extravagance, they have two of them. What we have today is a corporate duopoly, two parties that claim to have vastly different politics, but that have proven time and again that all they really care about is corporate interests. For example, Biden ran on being different from his predecessor, but deportations have increased, we still have kids in cages, police budgets have increased, the military budget has increased, and the corporate tax rates will remain the same. Materially, there is next to no difference between Republicans and Democrats, because they both receive funding from the same giant corporate interests. The Democrats would have you believe that they represent progressive policies. But when the ProPublica report came out, can you guess what their reaction was? It wasn't to launch an investigation into the state of taxation and corporate power, it was to launch an investigation into how ProPublica got a hold of their information. Then of course you have the Republicans being authoritarian as usual, with Mitch McConnell saying, whoever did this ought to be hunted down and thrown in jail. Think about it. The people who represent us are concerned not with the fact that the richest people on earth can pay nothing in taxes, but that those incredibly powerful people had their taxes leaked. Government officials don't care about normal people. They are bought and paid for by the very richest people and massive multinational corporations. The ultra-wealthy enjoy access to a completely different system than the rest of us. Most normal people receive an hourly wage or a salary. We're paid for our labor, and a cut of that money goes to the IRS in the form of taxes. If you've ever wondered why people like Elon Musk receive a fairly small salary, it's not because they're being self-aware or giving more to their workers, it's because they'd rather be compensated in ways that aren't taxable. Like we saw in the ProPublica explainer, instead of receiving a $10 million salary and paying 37% tax on it, the rich can just accumulate stock and borrow against it at a tiny interest rate, thus exempting them from the taxes the little people have to pay. The deification of oligarchs is fairly new in America. These days, you have people working 70 hours a week making $30,000 a year who will rabidly defend billionaires, because for some bizarre reason they think they'll be rich one day too. This hyper-individualist bootstraps mentality has completely destroyed class consciousness in America. In the past, the very rich were looked upon with suspicion and often hatred, and rightly so. Then, as now, the ultra-rich accumulated their wealth through the exploitation of others. During the Civil War, the rich had to disclose their income and tax payments. For example, in 1865, the annual income of moguls like William Astor and Cornelius Vanderbilt was published in the New York Times. Why? Because the public deserved to know what these people were making, especially because it was the American workers doing the labor that enriched those who owned the means of production. Unsurprisingly, these oligarchs used their massive wealth to force a repeal of the wartime tax law shortly after the war ended. Fast forward to today, and billionaires are nearly untouchable. 
We can't tax them. We can't criticize them because they're, quote, job producers. We're indoctrinated to hold them in high regard simply because of their massive wealth. So what can we do? How can we make the radical changes necessary to fix the absurd money problems this country faces? One thing is certain, electoralism isn't enough. People will say, call your representatives, vote for progressive politicians, make your voice heard. Except those in power don't listen to what the people want. We have mountains of data that shows the only opinions that matter are those of corporate donors. The only thing in this country that is truly bipartisan is the desire to maintain the parasitic economic status quo in order to further line the pockets of the wealthy and powerful. Historically, the only thing that has kept these people in check has been fear. Now, for any alphabet agencies monitoring my videos, I am not advocating for violence. I'm simply stating a historical fact that the only times we've seen real, radical change have been in societies where normal people get so fed up with the status quo that they took matters into their own hands. Up until recently, I would have said any kind of mass popular uprising was highly unlikely in the US. But given what we've seen in the past year and a half, the strikes, protests, riots, and so on, it's become apparent that public sentiment seems to be shifting slightly away from electoral politics and towards a populist anger at those who control the levers of power. The critical missing piece, the bit that's been absent in the US for the last hundred years, is class consciousness. We're still very much in a sort of cultural, identity politics tug-of-war between Republican and Democratic voter bases. But I think people are finally beginning to rediscover the strong American tradition of class solidarity and mass organization. The ProPublica report is just the latest bit of fuel for the fire. Slowly but surely, average Americans are beginning to wake up to the fact that they've been given a raw deal. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of content is supported by my patrons on Patreon. This kind of video, while very important, is something that sponsors won't touch. To keep my channel running, I rely on sponsors, AdSense revenue, and donations from generous viewers. By producing content like this, I lose out on both sponsors and AdSense. If you enjoy the kind of videos I'm producing and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. You can find my Patreon page, join our Discord server, and get early access to every video at patreon.com slash second thought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous episodes by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.